What up? I'm Levi. So, our mothership just bailed hard, and we're totally out of gas. Uh, got any? Ubisoft's got a brand new IP they want to show off. An open world, or in this case, an open solar system, designed around spaceships that can instantly teleport different weaponry onto their wings and- Oh my god, is that Star Fox? Well, okay Ubisoft, I'll bite. Let's see if Starlink can make toys to life interesting again. But most importantly, how many Star Fox quotes can we barrel roll into this review? Welcome to Mojo Plays, and this is our review of Starlink Battle for Atlas. I'm in trouble. You don't barrel roll. Before we begin, we publish new content all week long, so be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. So we're taking a look at the Nintendo Switch version due to the fact that it has some exclusive Star Fox content. The game is available on PS4 and Xbox One without borrowing Nintendo's IP, though for my 25 hour session I ended up using Fox for the majority of the games for reasons I'll explain later. First of all, we need to talk about the game's main selling point, it's Toys to Life ship. The starter pack comes with a really well built R-Wing which looks great on anyone's desk to boast about at work. Nudge, nudge, hint, hint. It's lightweight and is placed on a specifically designed Joy-Con dock that's also provided. That's roughly the same size as the regular dock, though the handle grips are noticeably smaller than the Switch's standard. You also get two pilots to put in your ship, an ice missile launcher and a flamethrower weapon to attach to the wings as well. Another ship, the Zenith, and a Gatling gun called the Shredder is also available in the game digitally. The PS4 and Xbox One versions only come with one pilot and has the Zenith ship instead, but also has the Shredder as a physical item, nothing digital. Okay, I can handle it. I think. As for how well the ship feels on the controller, it's pretty comfortable. It has a very well balanced weight distribution to the point where it feels like it's only slightly heavier than the regular controller. And you can take off the wings and put them on backwards, and that, and that even shows up in the game. But I barely use the toys. It was fun to mess around with for about an hour or so before I just picked up a pro controller and went to digital mode, since rebuilding the ship takes just as much time as changing it in the pause menu. But if you want to mix digital weapons on a physical ship, can't let you do that, Star Fox! So as cool as the R-Wing looks, it works better as a display piece than an actual game input. Yeah, or just enough to be blown to pieces. Hit it, Chase! Starlink is set in the Atlas system, where an expedition team is on the search to learn of the origins of Judge, a hive mine alien that crashed to Earth years ago and taught its leader, St. Gran, how to create a superpowered element known as Nova. Only for their ship to get infiltrated and their Nova power core stolen. Oh, and Sengirad is taken captive as well by this guy named Graxand. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I cannot take this guy seriously. And yes, it has everything to do with that mask. It's not like it's intimidating or creative like, say, Majora's mask. It's just some gold mask with feathers and those things probably itch as well. Also, he never takes the mask off. So why have a main villain wear a mask if there isn't going to be a big reveal around it? I mean, ah, uh, why? He's, he looks stupid. Your crew is lost. So anyway, St. Grad is captured and it's up for the rest of the crew to band together and stop the Forgotten Legion and take back the Atlas system. If you're wondering where Star Fox fits into the story, well, they're in Atlas looking for Star Wolf's leader, Wolf O'Donnell, and that's pretty much it. While they do appear in most of the game's major cutscenes, their interactions with the rest of the characters is very minimal, to the point where there's even some scenes where they don't even have any dialogue. They're just silent. Dude, that's intense. There aren't enough of us. The Legion is growing. We need to keep growing. The characters don't develop much throughout the game either. Most of them have two-dimensional personalities such as Levi, who is an obnoxious social media addict at the start of the game and, well, still is by the end of it. Hey man, uh, so totally forgot what I was looking for. Was it like a, like a beehive or, or wait, no, 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 a, a shrimp hive, right? In fact, you could literally say the same thing about every other character and their personality. The only two characters that get anything close to development are the babyface Mason, who's also the most boring character in the whole cast. And then there's Judge, who's, while interesting, his origins don't really go anywhere. So while I admire the story for its presentation, it leaves a lot to be desired. I sense that there is interference. As far as gameplay goes, Starlink is a space combat and exploration game based in one solar system. There's seven planets to travel between, and while that does sound small, each of the planets do have very distinct biomes and natural hazards scattered throughout. Not to mention some really breathtaking scenery. The game also has two main modes of traversal, your standard air and space flight, or your ship can hover along the ground with short boosters where you can try hovering to essentially complete platforming puzzles. Yeah, yeah, I know what you're thinking. How do you have platforming sections with spaceships that can fly? 
Well, that's because throughout the game, there's certain quests that require the player to carry a heavy item up a network of tall structures, with said item being too heavy for the ship to fly. Space combat is also really challenging, and if you want to fly around too carelessly, you will get shot down. But never give up! Trust your instincts, and you'll eventually learn how to track your prey, avoid swarms of targets, and after a while, you'll become quite a pilot! Although you'll spend most of the game in ground-based mode, where combat pretty much becomes a strafing and shooting match. Not as good as the space combat. Our allies must be protected against threats like this. We better take action. Each ship and pilot also have their own progression system that can be increased by the massive influx of modifications you can collect throughout the game. That's a lot! Though because the progression system can be pretty slow, you're more than likely better off to stick with just one ship, and maybe two for backup if that one gets shut down, rather than having to grind up every single ship. That's why most of the footage you're seeing here is Fox and his Arrowing. Oh, my poor heart's thumping like a bunny. I can't take this. Weapons come in five different classes. Kinetic, Fire, Ice, Gravity, and Stasis. Fire and Ice weapons are pretty self-explanatory. Kinetic weapons are neutral. Gravity weapons create mini black holes that can trap enemies for a short time. But don't get too close, Fox, because they can trap you if you get too close too. Stasis weapons make enemies near weightless and send them flying with a strong blast. Even cooler is that because your ship has two active weapon slots, firing them simultaneously can create unique attacks like the Fire Vortex, where you can shoot fire into a gravity weapon's black hole and create constant damage. It's pretty sweet. Rogue Outlaws eliminated. Nice one. They'll think twice before coming back. That said, extra weapons are only available if you purchase them separately. You can't unlock them. If you only get the physical starter set, you won't have access to any stasis or gravity weapons unless you pay extra. This is a problem because there are some side activities that require those weapons in order to obtain certain loot. Let me repeat that. There is loot in the game unobtainable to the player if they don't pay real world money for the right weapons. That is bad Ubisoft. Very, very bad Ubisoft. So you're saying we should shoot it? What? No, don't do that. Yet that's not even my biggest issue with the game. No, the biggest issue is that it's very repetitive. The main goal of the game is to build up a strong army in each sector of Atlas by taking down the Forgotten Legion's major dreadnoughts. To beat one dreadnought, you have to weaken them first by taking out all of their connected giant walkers known as Primes that they've sent down to the planets. But you have to weaken the Primes first by taking down the extraction towers that they plant everywhere. And there's a lot of extraction towers across all the planets. The fights with the towers essentially come down to destroy all the energy balls in the surrounding nodes to make the main tower's shield drop, and then when the shield is gone, shoot the core! Rinse, repeat, throughout. While the extractors have minor differences in their fights, practically every single Dreadnought and Prime fight plays out exactly the same way. And considering the campaign lasts an average of 20 to 25 hours, there really needs to be more variety to justify that length. If this Prime had gotten any stronger, even the Uspor might have been at risk. Good work. Piece of cake. What? Is that all they've got? Well, not quite. There are a few side stories and unique set pieces, such as Fox's eventual showdown with Wolf, but the unique moments are few and far between, which is a shame considering how well this game does its space combat. And the worst part is, they're headed to your place on Tundria now. Good. Exactly. Glad you, uh... Wait, uh, why is that good again? And while the Switch version does have a few frame rate drops and draw distance issues, it's a pretty visually stunning game thanks to each world's unique landscape. There is one final point I want to touch basis on, the different versions. Despite its $75 to $80 US retail price, the physical starter pack also has the least amount of content. It only has two ships, two pilots, and three weapons. Compare this to the cheaper $60 digital version, which has five ships, seven pilots, and 12 weapons. And then there's the $80 digital deluxe version, which is almost the same price as the physical version, and that has six ships, 10 pilots, and 15 weapons. Not only that, but any extra physical content, because they're toys, cost twice as much to purchase them separately than if you were to purchase them digitally as DLC. As such, if you want to play this game, I strongly, strongly recommend choosing the digital version. Okay, finishing the upgrades. I can see a way to provide even more Electrum, with a little help from you, of course. With all that said, however, my feelings with Starlink was that while I enjoyed the game for its combat and exploration, it needed a lot more quest variety to keep me invested after I beat the main game especially if it wants to justify all of its separately purchased ships and weapons, because right now, it does not. It may be worth picking up in a digital store sale, but stay away from the physical version. The extra toys do not justify its small amount of base content and expensive add-ons. So wait for a digital sale. Mm. Mm. 
Slippy. Yes, sir. I have the air horn right here. What? No, I'm awake. Good. Then let's rock and roll. Check out these other great clips from Mojo Plays, and be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos.